This is something that should concern everybody, a member of the public, whether you hunt big game alone, fly fish, it doesn't matter what your sport is. The fact that a once very widely distributed, very abundant, and pretty liberally harvested species was even proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. It should be a wake-up call. A wake-up call and a concern to everyone. 350 plus species of plants and animals have some level of dependency on this unique ecosystem. And it's mule deer, pronghorn, so it's not just about sage grouse. I don't know if people understand how powerful the Endangered Species Act is, but if you suddenly had a listing of a species, it affects everything you do. It would affect agriculture, it would affect tourism. We don't want there to ever be a need for that. We want to be doing things that keep that species on the landscape in perpetuity. are doing a lek survey on sage grouse this morning and I have my two daughters mm. JC and Ennis mm. and we don't want to get too close but we're gonna get these guys on the binoculars get the spotting scope out Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, probably two dozen birds. About the same as the last time we were here with the girls. Why are they out there? To make chicks. They're doing it to make chicks. The ones that are like boop, 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 that are dancing. Are those males or females? No, males. Those are males. And the females are all, they're all gathered around them, right? So this is a, called a courtship display, and they're on what's called a lek, L-E-K. I'm really glad you guys are here to see this this morning. This is cool. Look, the sun's coming up. It's a beautiful morning. Birds have kind of been my thing for since I was a little boy. Bird hunting was something we had access to more than anything else. And I just had a thing for grouse, man. They're the native game bird to the Americas, North America. Stone dead. And yeah. I'm killing birds that are going out of the decoys, you know, boom, 60 yeah. yards and just folding them. And they're like, dude, what are you shooting? Yeah, sage grouse are 100% dependent on sagebrush, but there could be too much of it. <laughs> yeah. You can have a, uh, you can have too much. Kind of like these nice mosaics. Windblown tops. I've always, I've always seen them a lot on windblown tops. Yep. Right there. Shoot. Might be another Bless one. You. Might be another one. I didn't notice the dog getting dirty. I didn't. Back there, back there. I hope you got that. <laughs> We're at a point with sage grouse where 
there's a pretty big concern about the future of this bird. But it's like, okay, if there's concern regarding these birds ending up on the ESA as an ESA listing, why are we hunting them? Well, it's a great question, and it's one that we should be able to answer. So there's all kinds of things going on in the sagebrush ecosystem that are threatening, but never once considered hunting a primary threat to the species. It obviously takes individuals out of the sure. population, sure. but it's never been considered a primary threat because the focus has and should be on habitat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. They're not oh, making eggs. That was quick. Man, that was. Right out here in the open in the wind. That's funny because I, I thought I thought Mackinac got birdie back well, there. I saw head him went hit. down and his tail started going and I'm like, nah. So the heads of these draws are always going to be good for upland birds. They're protected. Sure enough, a pair of them. It used to be very liberal seasons. Long seasons. Yeah, when it was three birds a day and nine right. nine in possession. And now we we shot a limit today. We shot two birds each. Yep. And. You can have four in possession now and a short, much shorter season. And in some parts of Colorado where I hunt often too, it's just a two day season, a two bird limit. You know, if we keep taking uh, a hack at the harvest opportunity, what is that telling us? It, it seems to me it's a metric of failure. We are failing on the habitat front. Right. Because this is something that should concern everybody, a member of the public, whether you hunt big game alone, fly fish, it doesn't matter what your sport is, the protection of this landscape is critically important and the fact that a once very widely distributed, very abundant, and pretty liberally harvested species was even proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. It should be a wake-up call. A wake-up call and a concern to everyone. Yep. I just needed to pause for a minute and take in that vista. Sage grouse country is gorgeous. I don't care what anybody says. People that see a barren ocean of sage are missing the brush for the sage, I guess you could put it. This ecosystem provides go. so much. 350 plus species of plants and animals have some level of dependency on this unique ecosystem. And it's mule deer, pronghorn, all kinds of different creatures and, and plants that depend on it. So it's not just about sage grouse. So I'm pretty sure it went down right in here somewhere. Find it, find the bird. Good boy, here, here, come here. Hey, good boy, good boy. Look at that, look at that. What role does habitat play in the sage grouse story? So habitat is everything. Um, and that's true for every species. It's not just sage grouse, but habitat is everything. They are 100% dependent on sagebrush. And even though they'll eat alfalfa, sure. um, even though they'll eat other things, they cannot get through winter without the sagebrush. That is 100% of their diet. Sagebrush also provides a lot of cover and provides a nursery for some important plants that sage grouse also eat, particularly during the rest of the season. So you have to have sagebrush, but you also have to have that native healthy understory and if, and if we see those diminished or replaced that becomes a challenge for sage grass to get the, the food the nutrients that they need how much habitat are we are we talking we don't have an actual minimum habitat amount for sage grass we don't have that number and in part it's because of their lifestyle but it makes it very challenging for us to say oh if we have 40 acres here or 40,000 acres here we're okay Lens, lens so what are you recording? Date, time, my name, which I still remember. It's <laughs> uh, a good day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Number of males, females, unknown if couldn't classify them. Then if the wind is under over 10 miles an hour, ideally you want it to be under 
if there's recent or current precipitation. And now we got to hurry to the next lake. Yep. <laughs> this next lake is called the Sublet Lake. And, uh, Sublet Lake. Yeah. It was actually discovered in the mid 90s. It was a huge lake. There was a couple years where you had uh, over 200 males on it. Holy smokes. It's gone to zero. Wow. Yeah, it makes you wonder what happened. So that lake, those birds were just this whole horizon. They'd be silhouetted on that hill, coming down in this big opening. They were just everywhere here. And now, I will be surprised greatly to see something. So you're a sage grouse hunter as well as a retired biologist. Uh, I certainly am. My dogs and I enjoy hunting sage grouse. Tell us a little bit about where we're at and what we're doing this morning. Here we're in the Green River Basin and not too far outside of Farson, Wyoming. The term the Golden Triangle has been uh, coined for this particular area and one of the reasons for that terminology is, is the sage grouse density uh, as well as some of the big game values here in terms of the, uh, migratory mule deer, pronghorn, and, and uh, wintering elk down here. So it's got a lot of wildlife values. It's a relatively undisturbed landscape. It's the highest density in the universe of sage grouse. There have been grouse that have been documented to move between their winter range and their summer range pushing 100 miles. They are truly a landscape species. They're not like a pheasant that can live its entire life on one square mile of farmland. They're just a completely different life strategy. What do you see on, on an average on these leks? What are you averaging for males? That varies by the year. Uh, what we see is some tendency to be cyclic. There's been some data from many populations in Wyoming that shows that their populations are mimicking what rabbits are doing. The concern with sage-grouse populations, though, is that the peaks are getting lower and the valleys are getting lower. It's mimicking what we're seeing with mule deer numbers. Yeah. You know, you were giving us some historic lek count data just from 2016 to 2022 this spring, watching the numbers decrease. Chicks are relying on uh, green groceries, like wildflowers, to eat, but also the insects that those kind of plants produce. Those green groceries aren't there. To get those chicks to survive, we're just not getting that to happen. Uh, unfortunately, we just seem to be in pretty exceptional drought conditions. least one and uh, uh, it was actually this fence I drove and walked one day and found in a three mile stretch 40 of these and we're gonna there's three of them right along here yeah, and it's, it and it's like been marked there's another one right up here it looks like there's another one yeah so another one here and sometimes you'll find the carcass laying there bones and etc but it's pretty obvious that the cause of death wasn't predation it was the fence. the fence so there's kind of two arms of this reservoir and there's birds that'll be in that straight off our nose hopefully yeah, there's not much water is there nope. yeah here we are in april you know yeah. it's supposed to be it should be cool yep it's a wet time and you can see how it's drying out you see how the sagebrush is yep. coming into coming what in. used to be water and that's just a sign of that whole overall drying out of the landscape. Dang, there's nothing. Hmm. One of the things that I learned from you this morning was, and I'm not going to give it away, I'll let you explain it, but I never put two and two together. Their strutting display is that it's not just visual. 
but there's a, a sound component, some very subtle sounds. Their feathers on those white breasts are very stiff. When that male's bringing those wings up, he's raking them back down and they, it makes a zip sound. You don't hear that unless you're very close. Right. But they wouldn't do that if it didn't serve a purpose for reasons we don't understand as humans, but that's part of the display that attracts the hens. They need a relatively quiet environment for that to happen. Well, the highway sounds or sounds in general can cover up the sounds that they're trying to make. And so maybe the hens aren't coming in to that lack and over time, the numbers just fade away. Out here in this wide open high desert country, it is an impact that I, I never thought of the highway noise, you know, but if you're sitting out glassing, hunting deer or antelope in this country, you can hear that highway from a long ways away. Yeah, the work that was going on here in 1950, Robert Patterson had about 40 some leks in this country that he monitored and we've gone back since and now there's about nine of those that are still active. And if you go to those inactive ones in the morning, you can hear that highway. So Todd, here we are, spring of Wyoming. We are headed to Cheyenne to talk to some of the stakeholders about sage grouse. Who are we talking to and what are we talking about? Well, we've got biologists, oil and gas representative, and then we're going to sit down and visit with one of the original members of the sage grouse implementation team and talk about policy, meld it all together to help tell this story. Where do we go from here? What's the future look like for these birds? It's gonna be an interesting road for, for me because I don't know a lot about it. I'm gonna have a lot of dumb questions. Your perspective is aligned with the majority of people's perspectives. They may not know very much, if anything, about these birds and about why they should care. Sage grouse habitat covers 70% of the state of Wyoming. What Wyoming itself is really ground zero for, uh, for the West's entire population of sage grouse. You know, so you look at 11 state region and then you boil it down to where about half the birds live, they're here in Wyoming. Because of a number of different factors, drought, predation, development, disease, and, and lots of other factors, sage grouse, they've had a rough road the last 30 to 40 years. My name is Paul Woolrich. I currently serve as Vice President for Jonah Energy. Uh, we're a large natural gas producer in the western part of the state. Uh, we operate the Jonah Field. Why are sage grouse so important? The fate of the sage grouse uh, is very closely tied to the fate of Wyoming's economy. Okay. Uh, Wyoming's way of life to some degree. Uh, and a listing is absolutely the worst thing we could do both for the bird and for Wyoming's economy. There's no question that significant human activity and density on the surface has an impact on the bird. The challenge for Wyoming is we've got declines in areas where we've got a lot of development, we've got declines in areas where we've got moderate development, and declines in areas we have no development. So we clearly have to look at tackling the sage grouse problem with a much, much wider scope in certainly wider lands. We absolutely contribute. Uh, and we absolutely have impact uh, as an industry. There's no question of that. How much of an impact and how much we can mitigate that, uh, we're still working through and we're seeing great progress. So the bigger question is uh, what's going on with the sage grouse population range wide uh, that needs truly landscape level approaches? Sage grouse are very sensitive to human disturbance. Sure. The number one reason why they're so sensitive is because they exhibit what we call fidelity to every aspect of their life. So, so they're very hardwired to attend the same lek every year. Hens then nest generally in the, almost the exact same areas every year. They tend to winter in the exact same areas every year. One more 
correlation with mule deer. It's interesting that that lek might not have got disturbed, but you're disturbing 15 miles away where that hen was nesting. And you may not know that if you're not looking at it as a broad scope. Exactly. So, One of the biggest problems that we face with sage grouse, sagebrush, the ha you know habitat issues are the encroachment of invasive annual grasses. And cheatgrass is kind of the threat number one. And as cheatgrass establishes is what can happen is it can actually bring a more frequent fire return interval. It's called cheatgrass because it grows really quickly and it's an annual grass unlike most of our, our perennials, dries out really quick and so it can be especially prone to fire. The cheatgrass is all brown headed out and the other grass doesn't even have heads on it yet. You know. Correct. And thankfully in Wyoming, it hasn't been a huge issue from a fire perspective. Certainly cheatgrass is a massive concern to us. But in places, in even drier places in the Intermountain West, and especially places like Nevada and parts of Oregon and Idaho, there are places where giant chunks of sagebrush, complete stands of sagebrush have been burned and have never recovered since. People that aren't from the West, they see sagebrush and they, you know, it might be you know, knee high or it might be waist high, and they don't realize that that waist high sagebrush might be 70 years old. And so when you burn up several hundred thousand acres and then you have another fire come through in five years, not only have you lost the sagebrush, but you've lost the species that rely upon it. They just don't use it anymore. When they don't use it, they go other places and if there's not enough habitat, then their numbers are gonna drop. This is what mule deer dreams are made of. 200 inch velvet, Idaho public land DIY buck. It doesn't get any better than this. Fire's normal. I don't want to say fire's a bad thing, yeah. right? Fire's normal. This kind of fire isn't. And this kind of fire frequency isn't. Sagebrush habitat, the best of the best. Really high quality habitat, high value for sage grouse and other species. I think we have 32 million acres of it left and we're losing 1.3 million a year. Something like 70, 75% of that loss is from fire. It's from fire. You know we're losing habitat, we know, we know, but that big a number, that's alarming. I worked on three listing decisions. The very last thing anyone wants to do is list a species. Because not only is that species then in trouble, not only has our wildlife management quote unquote failed, but that ecosystem on which the species depends is in trouble. So how does that play in with cattle? Cattle typically, if they are properly managed and they're not overgrazing their landscape, typically are not an issue. When sage grouse are nesting, we like to have some residual cover. But if you're a cow and you're going to be out there in the landscape eating, you're not reaching up underneath the sagebrush bush right. to eat that stuff. So well-managed livestock grazing is, is compatible with sage grouse, is compatible with conservation of sagebrush ecosystems. I have equated in my brain for a long time, you know, these birds, depending on your point of view, whether they evolved or created, put here, whatever, however you want to view that, they lived alongside bison for eons, right? Centuries. And the great herds of bison no longer are grazing the, the, that sagebrush ecosystem, which is kind of cool because last year when we were filming, I found a bison sheath, horn sheath. There's been grazing on this landscape since the beginning. That's a bison horn sheath. You just never know what you're gonna find out here. It's pretty deteriorated, I can't believe. That is wild, but that's what that is. Somewhere around here, there's a bison skull, probably buried. You know, you look out here and it looks like a moonscape. There's just this, there's less cover, there's fewer forbs. Birds have got to cover a lot more ground to meet their needs out here on this landscape. And we're gonna work our way back to the truck we're gonna go hunt more of a mesic wet zone. Not because those birds need water. They get most of the water that they need, if not all the water they need from their food, from what they eat. But 
those mesic wet zones hold higher moisture content forbs and feed that those birds can eat and there's more moisture in that so that's what those birds are seeking out so we're going to hunt this out back to the trucks and then we're going to relocate to a little bit wetter spot i mean everything is going to be dry out here this is dry country anyway and these birds are very very well adapted and created to live in this environment so took the brownies for a walk That's a habitat destroyer right there. If we're not addressing that as part of the problem, we're blind. We're not being honest with ourselves. And I know it's a controversial topic, but in short, they are an invasive species that is incredibly hard on the resource. We have a problem with them in Wyoming. We have a problem with them across, all across the West. That's part of what we're dealing with with threats to the habitat are those feral horses. So we've talked a lot about habitat, but one of the things that doesn't get talked about is predation. It's almost like they, they mention it, but they don't want to talk about it in the data. I have a friend that uh, spent, he works for the federal government, and he spent a pile of time in, uh, in this type of habitat. And what their intent was, I mean, he spent 180 days or some crazy thing. Their intent was to see what type of predation was happening, not just on the lex, but they also wanted to see what happens in the life cycle from the lek to the nesting to when those hatch. And he was telling me that the amount of eggs that a raven will destroy in that time is unbelievable. What they do, I mean, we got a nice little breeze right now, which is perfect for those ravens to get up in the air and they can coast right along top of these sagebrush, find a nest and you know, basically destroy it. Eat, yeah, they eat, eat the everything. eggs. They eat, they eat the eggs. They destroy it. Nest predators are the biggest predation factor that sage grouse face. You know, once these birds get to adulthood, like these birds out here, they're—I won't say predator proof, but they're hard. They're hard for predators to catch. Eagles are probably the most effective, and they're not very effective. These birds are very well adapted to their habitat. You'd, you'd think, oh, coyotes. Coyotes don't catch them. They, they they literally don't it's predation in the nest ravens being the big one ike you're spot on anybody that's spent time in the sagebrush ecosystem has watched ravens just hover along the ground and that's what they're doing they're hunting one of the subjects that i've always bring up is those ravens they need a perch we well, look out here there's and nothing if there's if if there wasn't man-made structures there would be nothing for those ravens and that's to where perch. those ravens nest as well and when you get man-made structures like abandoned buildings or old cabin power sheds, power lines, pipelines, they have to have some place that they can build a nest because they're not ground nesting birds. Right. And so when you get human interaction with the environment, ravens thrive. Yep. Sage grouse, not so much. Well, and one <laughs> of the, the problems with the ravens is they're federally protected. So now you have one federally protected species potentially affecting another species that it could be federally protected and and how do we manage that what do we do as stewards of, of the landscape and stewards of this habitat we've figured out on the waterfowl side of things yeah. we can manage habitat and create phenomenal habitat but if we're not managing pre nest predators especially we're going to struggle to produce birds yeah. let's get out of here and let them do their thing they're out there that's just cool Doing to see what them. they do in March. I love it, dude. So cool. I love it. Whether it's declines in mule deer, sage grouse, or whatever, a lot of folks want to point their fingers at just one thing. 
We also have to always pay attention to and respect like just the cyclical nature of sage grouse populations and just what goes on um, just in the natural world as well. Having said all that, it, it's, it still doesn't mask the fact that that sage grouse are very sensitive to human disturbance. If these ecosystems are so sensitive and they recover so slowly or maybe not recover at all from fire for, as an example, man, how long does it take those populations? What is our true carrying capacity? Yeah, and I think in addition to that, what is normal? Okay. Yeah. What's our baseline? And so there's a very good chance that a lot of those populations, whether it's mule deer or sage grouse that we saw in the 50s and 60s and 70s that people think we should get back to, may not have been sustainable over the long term. That's also not to be used as an excuse to do nothing. Right. Because in the, on the modern landscape, the sage-grouse declines that we're observing, the mule deer declines that we're observing are absolutely real and unfortunately are continuing. The story that I'm hearing here is it's declining, but it's not lost. What needs to happen is the work needs to be done so that we can sustain it and maintain it. And Wyoming is the leader in that. the sage grouse implementation team. Governor Friedenthal, which is three governors back now, right. he tasked you with that. What is it and, and how is it unique and what's your role in that? So Ryan Lance, who was on his staff at the time and I were tasked with that. And we came back to Gov Dave and said, you know, we think we ought to create a, a multidisciplinary group that actually sits down, makes a recommendation back to you uh, we'd include industry, environmental groups, mining, agriculture, uh, all of the agencies, federal and state that are affected, county commissioners. So my role is I'm the chairman. So you have this about 26 people total that serve on that group. They're passionate, they're intelligent, and they're very, very uh, well read on the topic. And so they represent their particular, not point of view, but their user group, if you will. As we started, we were humming right along. We had two goals that we wanted to meet. We, we wanted to prevent the need for listing sage grouse. And secondarily, we wanted to maintain our economy. Well, our economy is dependent on extractive minerals. Our economy is dependent on agriculture. It's dependent on tourism. And so you had to have those people at the table to where they could represent. It's never really happened well. In, in Wyoming or in conservation or wildlife that you have all of the stakeholders coming together in doing that. It's a new way of thinking and a new way of doing business. We did it again with migration and the governor signed an executive order on migration, mule deer migration. Yeah. Again, the first one in the country. It works. It works if, you're, if your people are honest with each other and if they're dedicated and you keep your goal fairly simple. So the way that it works, the SIGIT, the Sage Grouse Implementation Team is advisory to the governor. Of Wyoming. Okay. Of Wyoming. And, okay. and so they make recommendations that are all embodied in the executive order from the governor, which applies to all state agencies. If somebody came in and said, hey, I wanna drill a well and I wanna do it in this general area, then they would sit down with them and say, okay, right next to this road where there's already impact or on this piece of ground that's already been burned, is the best possible place to put that because you're not going to destroy or remove habitat. And so if the company does that, then they've avoided. They don't need to pay mitigation. They don't need to do that. And industry has been phenomenally good in this state of, at avoidance. There's a negative connotation out there of people going, well, energy, they're just out there, you know, messing up habitat. Set the record state. Tell us what is really happening out there and how you guys are, are trying to, to do it the right way. That one of the biggest challenges we have is that misconception, the misconception, you know, that, that oil and gas uh, and sage grouse are not compatible. And it, we've worked and I've worked for over 20 years to you know, dispel that a very serious myth. And it certainly is a myth. Operators, large and small, spend an enormous amount of money voluntarily reducing their impact. Uh, our hierarchy is very simple. Uh, we avoid disturbance and impact where we can. 
we minimize if avoidance isn't possible, and the last tool we use would be mitigation. And almost all of our focus right now is on avoidance and minimization. Let's talk about mitigate. What does that mean to a layman like me? What it means is that I'm gonna have an impact and I'm going to replace that impact somewhere else. And it may be right next door, but it probably isn't. So if I'm gonna have 100 acres of habitat that is going to be removed from that bird's dominion, then I need at least 100 acres of habitat somewhere that's protected for the bird. Not necessarily that same bird because we manage them statewide. Right now we have a five to one offset. So if you impact an acre, you have to provide five. So when we plant a field, we get very aggressive on reducing our overall surface impact. Uh, we do that by deploying technology such as direction drilling on our rigs. And you guys were one of the first oil fields to do that, weren't you? We were. In, in, in a tight did, sand formation, that's correct. Today, we're able to horizontally drill. So yeah, literally 10 years ago, I would have to have a number of surface locations to access a section, 640 acres. Today, with horizontal drilling, I can access two to three sections with one well bore using wow. horizontal techniques. Deploying and, and taking the, the risk to deploy new technology to reduce impacts is something we take very seriously. We're also heavily vested in reclamation. So for what little disturbance we do have on the surface, we come in afterwards you know, with a reclamation team, recontour, recede, uh, and then monitor those locations for years. The success we've seen in the Jonah field has been uh, recognized worldwide in particular on reclamation. So that same acreage that, you know, that was limited in productivity for any sagebrush obligate species 10 years ago before disturbance, now with proper reclamation, has grasses, has forbs, has more insect abundance, which is all critically important to sage grouse and every other species. I'm gonna go down, Ed. I'll just start here okay. and go right in. So what we've got is we've got a wet spot. There's a mesic zone, and you can see it's got green all the way down through here. And we're gonna stay away from those rocks because we want to stay out of any rattlesnakes. But we're gonna hunt this sagebrush slope down all the way down through here. It's transitional habitat. Let's check it out. Yeah, this is really nice. I mean, you've got some standing water here, green vegetation, good sagebrush cover. Should find birds in here. It's good habitat. Yeah, that doe's in heat. They're just running her. They're gonna run right up to us. That's pretty cool. See, we got a handful of cattle over here. By and large, well-managed cattle grazing can uh, definitely be compatible. And we need those working ranches and landowners out here on the landscape supporting a healthy sagebrush ecosystem. That's all part of the, the big picture, it's keeping all the pieces together. And that includes the people out here on the landscape. Come on, come on. When you enter into that predator-prey relationship, you enter into a level of connectivity that it doesn't exist when you're sitting behind a camera. It's hard to describe, but you just, you feel it. Yep. But everybody has a stake in the game here. Hunters are contributing to the conservation of sage grouse, right. not just through purchase of licenses, but the Pittman-Robertson dollars that come through the sale of arms and ammunition that go to the states. It's, it's uh, divvied out to the states and Wyoming gets a big chunk, as do all the states. The managers have contributed part of that PR dollar funds that they get to sagebrush 
and sage grouse conservation. And between 2000 and 2012 alone, that was about $132 million. Wow, that is a big number. And we've had a decade since then, and they've still been pumping money into yeah. sagebrush conservation and sage grouse conservation. And something that is well worth mentioning is the private landowners and private efforts. And I've seen that firsthand. You know, last yeah. spring we had a chance to go down on the Pathfinder Ranch with Matt Hubler, and we helped with let counts. It was an incredible sight to see, obviously, those, those birds out on the lek. But what was even more impressive was the money being put into private habitat restoration. Well, Matt, we're standing here leaning on a fence with a top rail and a smooth bottom wire. We've got running water next to us. I'm assuming there's a spring up here in the trees. What is this? What, what have you guys done here? Well, what we've done here with this uh, wildlife friendly fence is we have built uh, an enclosure for the spring, an exclosure for livestock. We are part of a, a cattle ranch uh, with a working landscape but we're protecting a spring, and uh, Robert's spring to be exact. One that we collect the water, and we're moving into three different pastures from here, uh, as far as two miles away. Uh, that allows us to distribute livestock, utilize forage a little better, but from our wildlife standpoint, it allows us to protect the source, and water is life, and life to a lot of things, especially here in the, in the, the high desert of right, Wyoming. Right. So utilizing the water, being more efficient with it, uh, there's a lot of animals, a lot of species that are going to benefit from having that music, just that type of habitat. The grouse will come in here, they'll feed on those bugs. Sure. And the more we can protect of that, protect the source especially, and then as it moves down to what is Pathfinder Reservoir, it's just bringing it to a level of, of restoration that, that may have been here before the hand of man had its influence. Sure. And we had the opportunity to go do a let count with you this morning. What role is are the Pathfinder ranches playing in the conservation of sage grouse? We are the nation's first uh, sage grouse mitigation bank. And what is that? Uh, it's a business for us to enhance habitat. With that, enhance and protect. Uh, it, with that, we earn a credit. That credit is then sold, usually via government requirements. Okay. for someone who disturbed similar type of habitat. And it's not the, the postage stamp approach. A lot of failed restoration projects occur because money is, is put into a, a project to restore something nearby that may not be the best candidate. Sure. We have the data to show, and, and the grouse numbers, seven billion data points to show that, that we can support sage grouse in their four seasons of habitat. And so the money is more efficient, better invested, many times buying that credit to offset the disturbance elsewhere. I don't think a lot of people really understand the, the credit purchasing, the, and we're talking, we're talking carbon credits, correct? Well, there's a number of forms of, of okay. credits that exist. Okay. Uh, we started with sage grouse. Okay. We are looking at other credit opportunities. Uh, I have the paperwork into the Army Corps engineers to build a wetland and stream mitigation bank. Oh, wow. Uh, we are gathering the data uh, to analyze our ability to sell uh, the carbon that we store in these rangelands, mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of large landowners or landowners throughout the West. So it, the mitigation banking business is, is uh, got its foundation in wetlands. Uh, we are the first, the only mitigation bank in the state of Wyoming. We are the largest mitigation bank by sheer number of credits available in the entire United States. Wow. Due to the habitat that exists and, uh, and the measures that we'll take to, to protect and to advance the ecology of the area.
One of the stakeholders is private land. I mean, we're talking about public land, but private land has a huge part of this. Half the state is private land. They are aware of sage grouse. They're thinking about it. Every spring, as soon as the chicks hatch, I'm gonna get on my phone 30 or 40 photos from all over the state from friends of mine who are ranchers that say, look what's in our yard. They're proud of that and, they're, and, they, and they care about it. So private lands, because we can manage there more readily than we can a lot of times on public lands, private lands become vital to the long-term health of sage grouse. It's not just the private lands, it's the private landowners, the stewards out there who provide that habitat and do it knowingly and do it because they care. Day three of a hunt. We found some birds on public this morning and then they promptly got up in the wind and flew over to private. They're a little spooky. Winds, obviously, Wyoming wind, a factor this morning. Uh, it's much colder, so it's going to be a lot better for working the dogs. And we're going to make a hot lap through a nice draw and see if we can find some more birds. You ready, Mackinac? Let's go, bud. Woohoo! Let's go, hunt. Todd, you know, we've been getting these really nice little sagebrush draws and windblown flats. The habitat's in great shape. We've yep. got good bunch grasses. But here's the devil that you and I have talked about, and it's cheatgrass. And it's not real thick on this hillside, but you can see it right here. Boy, when that takes over a landscape, that's when you have the degradation of that habitat. That's the devil in the, yep. in the sagebrush sea right there. Cheatgrass. Not good. Yeah, it's bad stuff. Yep. What does cheatgrass mitigation look like? For a few years now, this, the Forest Service has been using a new herbicide. BLM is going through a process right now to approve that, um, to get that approved to be able to use on BLM lands. That herbicide has an effective rate of between 80 and 100% wow. of treating cheatgrass. The problem is if you, if you treat cheatgrass just on national forest lands, but you don't treat it on BLM lands, you're not solving the problem. Exactly. If you treat it on exactly. private lands, but not BLM <laughs> land, like you're not solving the problem. Like you have to have broad application. Absolutely. Now I'm not going to say it's without any risk. The Dazaflam it targets annual grasses. Like there, you can have some annual grass loss, native annual grass right. loss using it. So you have to have an active reseeding program after the fact. But it doesn't. It doesn't kill sagebrush, and it's very, very effective at treating cheatgrass. You know, you can use some targeted grazing uh, at certain times of year to try and uh, address cheatgrass, but with the number of acres that we have infested, yeah, it's almost impossible, it's almost impossible yeah. really. Once the seed head forms, it no longer has nutritional value. Nothing eats it. Nothing eats it. All it is is a fuel source at that point. Yeah. So there are treatment options, and they actually have to be used. We have to have the resources to do it, the want and the will to do it. Nevada alone, and I, I, I hate to pick on Nevada, but they're just in such a terrible situation now right. where they've got a combination of these fire and cheatgrass cycles, they've got feral horse problems, they've got just a number of things going on with uh, geothermal and other renewable sources coming in, lithium mining uh, for all the batteries for our electric cars we want to make. People think that electric cars are the way out. There's no free lunch in any of this, Todd, and you, you know go. that we have to really pump investments into the restoration to get that uplift, to get those populations turning around. We need to couch this in a way that we can create jobs, we can create an economy around restoration. Look at what Matt did at the Pathfinder. If you replicate that at scale for juniper removal, for cheatgrass restoration of habitats, where it makes sense to do so, some places may have to become sacrifice zones because you just may never get it back. Sure. You can crank funds into that and create a restoration economy coupled with these funds that are going into the private lands and help local communities out here in the West. Right. There's no reason we can't do that. 
And I've said for decades now, we have to figure out the best ways to make conservation an investment and not the proverbial impediment. We've done this before. The sporting community has been behind this. Now we even have a broader public that we can get behind this. And it's not insurmountable, but we're running out of time. And I'm not an alarmist, Todd, but we need to act now. We need to really get these habitats in better condition. That's how we get to success. I agree with you 100%. That was an amazing shot, dude. That's... Amazing shot. He had 15 Phenomenal. feet of lead. Of, I'm behind him, obviously, on the first one. Here. Here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. Good boy. Good boy. Boy. Drop. 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 it. Woo! Yeah, buddy. Yeah, double. Public lands. Stellar habitat. You find the right habitat, we take care of the habitat, we get birds. Good shooting, man. Yeah, you too. Really good shooting, you too. Hunt them up. Hunt them up. Quite a few jacks out here. If the trigger's gold, the jack will fold. So this is looking down, looking at my feet, because we're in rocky country, it's paying dividends. Found a bison horn, and now I found a piece of a sage grouse egg. That's from earlier in the year. That's what that is. That's a sage grouse egg shell. So this is our hatchery, and the entire facility is a hatchery. These are the sage grouse eggs that we collected, and uh, in 2021, we went out and collected 17 different nests. But these are all individual hatches, and on the hatch is the date and kind of where we got the bird from. Some of them, you know, like this batch of eggs right here, it only had two that hatched out of it. Right. You know, I had to candle them to see what stage of development that they were in. Yeah, because you would you have no way of knowing. I mean, this has not right. been done. It hasn't been done. That's right. right. Your sage grouse that you're hatching, do they stay here? Yeah, they do. So this is the brooder system right here I use. Uh, we're not going to go in there. You know, a lot of people can go to college for things. I spent 27 years of learning how to brood a bird, still learning. I mean, I'm the last to be boastful of it. So what we do though, is we start the chicks in the brooder. They have an outside little area here. Once they're used to the outside some, then we put them in a flight pin and here's the flight pin here. Hey, watch this. This is crazy. Nobody in the world has seen something like this, I can tell you. Look, I'm gathering her eggs. I pulled her eggs out, and she doesn't want me to pull them out. So she's she's pulling them back into the nest. I can live and breathe with the birds, so I mean, it's just, it almost, look at her. Look at she that. wants her nest to hear her eggs back. You can listen to the sounds. Yeah, you can hear her. This is just in a nest right here. I mean, you can't tell this isn't in the wild right now. See, I mark them so uh -huh. I know which ones I collected and which ones I... She's pulling them back. Yeah, in. look at that. Isn't that amazing? And that's a bird that's been brooded here on site. Yeah, that's one of those eggs you see so inside. those instincts. That's the instinct. 100% instinct. An incredible instincts that they keep. Now watch this, a male will come in. What, this is a male bird. He's coming into the nest. He's helping her get her eggs back in order. Look at that. Do they ever get aggressive with you? No, 
yeah, you know, pretty real passive, gentle, pretty passive. Pretty bird. passive. We wanted the, uh, these birds to be that way. We didn't want them to be wild where they'd slap us and you know, like a wild bird. So then, because we're basically trying to hatch those babies from you, them. You got to get production. brood stock. Yeah. yeah. yeah you can barely see her. And they're both on eggs in two different nests. Then the ultimate goal is to have a bird to be able to viable to, yes, to release. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You know that's a great goal. Or you know we've talked to some other people about using sage grouse to experiment with, like universities, consortiums that would get together, and instead of having to go get a wild bird, but say study West Nile virus, but use some of our birds to do sure. it. Sure. That's the first time I've heard that side of it yeah. brought up. That's less of an impact That's right. we have on wild birds. And then came up with a system where they could fog a lek when they're breeding with a vaccination that could keep them from getting West Nile. I mean, but they learned that from using our birds and they didn't have to mess with wild birds. And they birds. don't have to mess with wild yeah. birds. I want to know your thoughts on the captive rearing program. Hate it. History has told us and research has told us that once those birds are put back out into the wild, they typically don't survive. And then you run the risk of putting disease out there, that wild populations will not be able to survive. Are we willing to take that risk when we could be doing something on the ground in restoration? If I thought it would help the population, I am telling you, I'd be the first in line to say, do it. It's a colossal waste right now of private money, but it does take state time to do it. Why should the average Joe, the average citizen on front range in Colorado or in Maryland or back in the Great Lakes, why should they give two hoots in Hades about this? Okay, maybe you don't care about sage grouse. That's fine. You should care about your natural ecosystems because we rely on them. Our health and our well-being relies on them, whether your house sits on it or whether your house sits 50 miles away or 2,000 miles away. It's all tied together. And if we don't start really caring about these ecosystems, then we really can say, we don't care about our future. And it may not land on our backs right now. It's gonna land on your kids, yeah. your nieces and nephews, your grandkids. And I know that's an old story, but I think we're really starting to see it these days, what a big effect it can have. There's Wyoming as you are, part of your home. This is oh. the kind of crap yeah, that's you can snow, snow drift. It's huge. We just got absolutely hammered, and I'm, I'm hoping that this didn't really <coughs> hurt the birds and antelope. But I know it's I know it's going to get a lot of them. So, so I, I decided to get involved with the Dallas Safari Club because of the chapter programs. Unlike a lot of other nonprofit conservation organizations that are out there, all your money that you're raising for Wyoming Dallas Safari Club, our money stays in state. Pat Ginder, I'm also an outfitter in central Wyoming. I spend a lot of time out, out in the country. It's unbelievable uh, the amount of hours that a person can spend out there and what we're seeing with sage grouse is shocking. What I would like with Dallas Safari Club is, is to really put this out there. That education piece I think is so important and imperative for people to understand what's happening, not just as a local here growing up in Wyoming, but on, on a bigger scale. Anybody can get involved in this. Yes. I think one way people can get involved is, is joining conservation organizations such as the Wyoming D Dallas Safari Club. Go to the website, become a member, you'll start getting newsletters, you're going to see different events that we're putting on, whether that's boots on the ground conservation or honestly just membership drive. While we're doing the membership drives, we're going to be putting the films out like this and, and really hammering that conservation piece. You know, it's, it's a fight that, that any person out there can get involved in. If all you have is the ability to donate to an organization like Dallas Safari Club, do it. If you have the ability to donate and go out and help with habitat projects, awesome. If all you have is the ability to donate time and effort, in a project, go do it. Be a part of any any organization that you can that's going to bring this to attention. We got to fight now. And what's worst case scenario look like when it comes to sage grouse? Worst case scenario, we've been facing it for a while. Like it's it's out there and it's still a threat out there, and that's that we can't figure out how to turn the tide on this downward population trend and bring right. them back 
and that they ultimately get listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And if that happens, right, that's bad for the bird. That's bad for, that's bad for everything. Like, we don't want that. And I think we have a, just an absolute enormous opportunity right now, like a generational opportunity, because we've had, we've had the want and the will to do, but there have been limitations. You can have all the want and the will to do something, but if you don't have the, the financial support to make it happen or the tool, all the tools you need to make it happen, it's hard to get it across the finish line. Yes. But one thing we had happen is we had Congress this past year invest for the first time in my career in a really, really substantive way in large landscape restoration. I think it can be a game changer, but we have to be willing to recognize that it's there. We gotta point to shovel ready projects. We gotta get people mobilized to do work on the ground. They don't have enough people to spend that money in the time frame they've got. They're gonna need partners. They need organizations from all over the West saying, we got a project here. What sportsmen provide is equally as important as what birders provide to what mitigation banks provide. And, you know, the reports are in. We can't argue with the numbers. The grouse has been discussed for their habitat loss. And, you know, that's what we're doing at Pathfinder is, is trying to provide that opportunity. The more credits we sell, the more habitat work we get to do. Right. And the more permanent easement we get to put on the place. Some people used to think sage grouse was the species du jour. Yeah. You know, next year it'll be something else. Well, it's been decades now that yes. sage grouse have been the species du jour, and it's not going to go away. Educating ourselves, finding out the science is saying, and come into it with an unbiased, open mind, not a political slant. Science is ever evolving, and we need to continue to learn and improve. Uh, you that's know, why and it's it, a practice, right? That's why science is a practice. That's exactly <laughs> right. You know, and we're no different at Jonah Energy. You know, the, the science isn't settled on sage grouse. Uh, we need to continue to do better and better and invest in new science that's going to give us better tools to better manage the bird and habitat to the benefit of all of us here in the state. Isn't that funny stuff? Mm -hmm. Wildlife conservation doesn't happen overnight, and we right. got to recognize with sage grouse that we're not going to turn the corner on a dime. we got to be committed over the long haul to, to bring it back. I love that perspective. I think you, I think that is so spot on. In today's world, we're impatient in everything. You know, if it's not instant gratification right in the palm of our hand, we lose interest pretty quickly as a society. And this is the long game. And that's been the most incredible thing about this process is that it's not about your particular interest above all. It's about sage grouse. It's about habitat. It's about how do we do this intelligently and leave the pieces there so that we are not jeopardizing the bird.